All right, welcome everyone. So in my session today, I'm going to be talking about timing your trades using Fibonacci fans. Now, I don't use a lot of indicators in my trading. I've been trading for over 25 years now, full time. Since the mid 1990s is when I first um, launched my education site. I basically just uh, created a blog and shared with traders what I was doing and what I was looking at and uh, what I liked, what I didn't like. And I didn't have a good background in terms of technical analysis because at the time, you know, we were really just switching from floor traders to online trading. And there wasn't a lot out there as far as technical analysis went. It was kind of a bit of a, a voodoo type of way to analyze the markets. But I came from a background in arts and anthropology. Um, I was actually an archaeologist at the time. And I studied human emotions and relationships and patterns and pattern recognition. So what I did was I started to look at some core setups like, you know, bull flags and things like that, and kind of breaking down those patterns, looking for little individual pieces that would show me, hey, does this have a higher chance of success versus, you know, the trade that I took yesterday or last week? And I developed a system where um, every single strategy that I use in the markets is broken down into um, five things. Basically, I call them the building blocks of price development. So they include trend development, uh, time development, which is where our Fibonacci fans are going to come into play, um, support and resistance levels, also Fibonacci fans, um, volume, and uh, momentum, which we will also see as a very important factor with our Fibonacci fans. So what we're going to look at is not only how to use this indicator, uh, how to draw it, but also looking at the scenarios in which we want to use it versus the scenarios where it's not going to be as useful. So Currently, Fibonacci are the only type of indicators that I use in my trading. I'm mostly um, reading pure price action. And over time, you get really used to where these levels will fall. and You don't even have to put them on your charts anymore. But I don't use just one over the other. I don't rely solely on fans or solely on retracement levels. I look for areas where we're seeing multiple things coming together, where I have multiple pros coming together. So first of all, what are Fibonacci fans exactly? Well, these are based upon the Fibonacci ratios uh, in mathematics and the arts. And what we see in the markets is that humans tend to gravitate towards certain levels based upon our psychology and just how we relate to greed and fear. And the techniques that I'm going to show you today, I've even used in um, analyzing our COVID infection rates. And so it's really interesting how we can use the same techniques across anything that relates to human psychology and how we interact with the world. And there's a lot of, you know, questions over, hey, is Fibonacci kind of self-fulfilling? Does it work simply because so many traders use it? I don't think that's the case because I've never seen Fibonacci fans taught the way that I teach them before. And there's so many cases in which if you're placing them wrong, it's not going to give you good buy or sell levels. So we have to understand the scenarios where it needs to be applied versus the scenarios where it's not going to be as useful or as helpful to use them. So Fibonacci fans are a type of support and resistance level. You can kind of see that diagram over there on the left. And what they do is they give us an indication in terms of how long of a correction do we need compared to our impulse move, which is our trend move that we have going into a correction. How long of a correction do we need before we can get 
a good buy setup again. How long does this pullback need to last? So when we're looking at Fibonacci fans, one of the key things that I'm going to talk about is that if this is our trend here on the upside and we're attaching our Fibonacci levels from our low to our high of the trend, we're primarily going to be looking at the 76.4 Fibonacci fan as a support level for giving us trigger points. Now, one of the things that you're going to want is that if you look at the entire upside move here and then compare it to the corrective move that takes place, we need a pullback or correction that is going to last at least as long as that impulse move. So if the impulse move lasts for 30 minutes or our trend move lasts for 30 minutes, we want to see a pullback or retracement that lasts for another 30 minutes. It can double. So it can be 60 minutes. It can even go one and a half times. And that will normally be when you get uh, an inverse head and shoulders. And then you'll see it go about one and a half times. Um, so the 76.4% FIB fan, we need to have that hitting at at least that one-to-one -one ratio. So if you have a pullback that just drops like this into our fan, you can get a reaction off of that level, but it's not going to be an easy one to manage to break those previous highs. Uh, you can also get you know, reactions off of like the 61.8%. But again, that time aspect has to come into play is our correction at least a one-to-one -one ratio compared to that upside move. So if you get a setup coming in early off of like a 61.8%, that may just be your first um, pullback giving you a bounce back up before you get your second pullback into that 76.4. Now, another aspect that we have to look at when it comes to Fibonacci fans, whether we have a good impulse move or trend move that we can add a fan to is to look at the momentum. We can call this the Momo of that move up. And what that means is that we need a momentum move or impulse move that is average in terms of the momentum, slightly stronger than average or slightly less than average. We don't want an extreme move up and we don't want an extremely gradual move up. So the extremely gradual move would take your um, fib fan from there to there. The extremely steep one would go from there to there. In both of those cases, your fib fans aren't going to provide you enough incentive by themselves to say, hey, a pullback into that 76.4 is going to give me a really nice shot at a continuation. Typically, it can give you a little pop and then pull back longer. So if it's a very extreme move, I'll usually take that low and then I'll go to that second high and I'll use those parameters for adding my 76.4% FIB fan for a support level. And I'm going to show you examples of these on charts, but I just want to cover these two aspects of this as we're going into this, because it's imperative that you understand these two criteria in order to apply your FIB fans correctly. If it's too steep, you're not going to be able to get a pullback as easily that's going to lead to a breakout where your first wave and your second wave have the same size and the same momentum. It can break, but it's more likely to get stunted before it goes into another correction. Um, and then also with our time development, we need that entire upside move to then have a correction that lasts that same amount of time before we get the continuation. So any setup that triggers earlier than that, it can still give you a little pop on a smaller time frame, but it's not going to have an easy chance mimicking this initial move when it breaks out. It's more likely to get stunted and pull back. All right, so let's go on here. And we're going to look at 
our initial chart here in just a second. Um, you know, what makes Fibonacci fans so important is that they help take some of like the second guessing out of your trading. So when we have different levels of support and resistance that are all converging at the same time, it can help improve your confidence on a trade and it can show you hey is my trade too early does it have a lower chance of being a successful trade because of that factor or is it too late has it missed the time zone where it should have taken off and it hasn't done it at that point so those are some of the reasons that we look at fibonacci fans so this is our es here this is the move coming off of the highs on the 60 minute time frame over the last couple of weeks. And what I was looking for in the overall market was that we had a really nice impulse move here. And then we started to shift momentum. We had a two wave move here where the momentum shifted even further. And then we get this first initial pullback or correction. So what the Fibonacci fans do in a scenario like this is that they help us understand on a corrective move how far should that correction go before we have a, the highest probability of a strong continuation move on the downside so setups that take place earlier might give you a little bit of a move but then go into a longer base before we get a continuation. So it's not that you're not going to get setups that go early. It's not that you're going to get not get setups that go later than the Fib fans that both work out. But what scenario has the highest probability of success? So an earlier breakdown is going to have a higher probability that it gets stunted and comes back into range or reverses. A later one, let's say it comes over to here before it breaks down, also has similar risk factors. So when we're adding our Fib fans here, and I'm gonna show you how to draw this on the chart, notice that this move on the downside has a couple back and forth moves and has a really strong move here in the middle. So what I need to do is I need to use a move that is going to be closer to average momentum. Average momentum means that we have a channel where if we look back in the past, we see a lot of, you know, V's and inverse V type of moves. We want to look for zones that have that same V to inverse V. That's going to give us one example of what an average momentum move looks like. Also, an average momentum move will often have a lot of overlap in it and be punctuated by these periods of stronger impulse within the trend. Another way an average impulse move can form is it can have an extreme impulse move to start with. The amount of time of that extreme impulse move needs to at least double or quadruple before it continues. And then we can go from this high to this low based upon the two wave movement. And that will also be considered to be a typical or average momentum move. So those are the two ways that I look at momentum to tell me, hey, is this going to be a move that I can apply my FIP fans to? And it's going to provide a really nice resistance. So on this ES chart, I'm going to switch on over to my chart and show you how to add that onto it. I've got to grab my ES chart quick. And there's the NASDAQ. Here's the ES. All right. So this is where I have my current FIB fans. Um, when we're looking at, let me make this bigger here. When we're looking at the uh, initial reversal, I'm gonna remove this one. In, oops, sorry, wrong button. In um, NinjaTrader, 
we don't have Fibonacci fans um, on them. So I created a cool call, a tool called a Trade Tracker Pro, where we add them. So if we go under our drawing tool, it's going to be Fibonacci fans. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that high here. And if there's a double top, I'm usually going to take the first high and go from that first high. Then I'm going to go down to that last low. Now, what I would like to see to confirm that I've drawn these properly is that I'd like to see some reaction to the 50% fan and the 61.8% fan. It doesn't have to be both of them at the same time, but I do want a reaction off of uh, at least one of those levels. And in this case, both of them are stalling it. So that tells me it's a really good location. Now, another thing we can do to help us have confidence in this being a really strong reversal is to look at Fibonacci time extensions, which one of you guys had asked about here. And if we're looking at a pattern like a head and shoulders and we're trying to time that shoulder, this is another way that Fib tools can be used. We want to go from the high of that that left shoulder there to our head. And that's going to give us that 100% extension. Our trade for our shoulder should start moving as you're coming out of that 100% extension, unless your neckline is tilted to the downside. So your neckline takes your zone in here and connects it to this low. So here's the uh, left shoulder. It's a check mark. It's a tilted check mark in this case. And what we're doing is we're looking at this zone of congestion here, comparing it to this zone of congestion. They should be pretty comparable. Um, we don't want a huge amount of difference between the two. This one's a little bit shorter over here, but I'm going to show you some other examples of our time development in a few minutes. Now, what we want to see here then is that we've got that convergence of the two. Now, what we also can use are retracement levels. So if we go and add the Fibonacci retracement in here, we can look at where those retracement levels are hitting. And in this case, we're right at the 61.8%. So that means we could have a little bit of a pause at the previous low. If it pulls up 50% or more, it can go and give us a pause at the previous low. So in the best continuations, they're going to hold under that 50% retracement level. What that does is it prevents it from having as easy of a chance of going and doing this into another move where you get another correction back up into that fib fan level. So if your bounce is above that 50%, and oftentimes when it's right at 50%, this is a potential scenario that can happen that can create further development. And in that case, since that's past this 100% level, I would go and move my um, fib timing over to here and look at where that extension would be as well, as far as the fib time extension. So this shows you some basics. And after I get a two wave move down, I often take my fib fan, and this is where you guys saw me have it, um, where I'm looking at current trading here today, and I'll go move it to that second low. And what that does is that if this goes into another two wave correction, where this just becomes the two wave move down, two wave correction here, it gives me another zone that I can look for a continuation pattern there. So there's two places where this can get strong continuation moves. It can get a strong continuation move based upon this amount of correction repeated over here. And it can get this move then doing a two of correction over here. So we're more likely to get three waves and then it'll typically have a much more difficult time going into four waves. So you'll notice that it doesn't make it down to the low of that channel. It's very, very difficult when you have three waves of correction where the time development is the same between each one of those 
very difficult for that to put in a move for a fourth wave that is going to be as strong as the previous ones. It does happen, but it only happens about 20% of the time. So when you're playing your odds, yeah, you might get a short setup here, which you can see is coming off of that 50% Fib fan, but you have to pay close attention to where that momentum is because it might end up slowing and just forming uh, even an inverse head and shoulders like that or some other rounded low, or it could just go and, and hold that previous low and go into um, another range and shift up at that point. So the adjusted fib fan, what it's going to do is it's going to continue to provide me support and resistance levels now at, into today's session and uh, as we head into uh, the end of the week. Now let's go back to my slides here. And I'm going to show you the progression here on this. Oh, first of all, if you guys are on Ninja Trader, if anyone's on Ninja Trader and you want to add that trade tracker tool that has the Fibonacci fans and arcs, go to tonyhansen.com backslash uh, trade tracker. And we have a special running on it um, right now. Uh, we usually have it at $3.99. Currently, we have it at $79. And it's a lifetime license to use it. So if you go and upgrade your trade tracker, or sorry, your Ninja Trader, you can still go and uh, re-download the tools to add. All right, so here's our original one. Now I showed you guys the head and shoulders. Also notice the volume decline here. So we have an initial volume spike coming off of that high, but then as our shoulder is forming, we have that decline in volume. You see a similar decline in volume here, during the next correction, but not as much of a decline on that third correction, which goes into what we were talking about just a couple of minutes ago, where that second continuation still has a good um, probability. It's closer to about 50-50 that it's going to break the previous lows. Um, the other chance, again, of course, would be that it goes into a longer base before it goes lower. So there's still, you know, decent potential for it to go lower. It just might um, double that base before it does so. So when it goes that uh, same amount of time, I'm going to go and look at, hey, where's the next level that I can apply my fib fans? So you'll see here that we've got a zone of three lows or three highs in here. I will go from that middle high, or if there's two highs like here, like I showed you earlier, I'm going to use the first high to anchor my fib tool to. If there's only one high, but there's two lows, then I will make um, a change at times that I will go and anchor it to the second low. So that's something that we will look at. Now on this one, the momentum down here, notice that even though there's you know a lot of um, overlap on those smaller moves, if we were to look at a different time frame, this could still look like a pretty steep move on the downside. So I would be looking at this as a primary resistance level to watch for, but I would also keep in mind that because this impulse move is so strong, I could get more of a false start or have it struggle to react and give a setup off of that 76.4 fan. So the other factor that helps increase the probability of the reaction off of that level is that this time correction here and then this time correction are almost exactly the same amount of time. So that increases my probability that my FIB fans are going to work out really well. The other thing, of course, is the volume drop that you see there. And then we also have the overall momentum factor looking at the upside to the downside move. So if this downtrend here has comparable momentum to the upside or stronger momentum than the upside, 
then this is still a zone that you would want to watch for smaller time frame uh, continuation patterns on that downside. They would be reversal patterns on, you know, the smaller time frame. But things like, in this case, a head and shoulders, and continuation patterns based upon that. Oftentimes, if there's a question as to how well that resistance level is going to hold just because of the extreme momentum here, I will look at not the first test of the resistance, but I'll look for a secondary test of it to go and look for a trigger point. So that can give me a better probability because it can show me what the initial reaction was in terms of momentum off of that resistance. So if it reacts, you know, really strongly to begin with, then I know that there's a better chance that a continuation is going to work out well. We don't always get a second chance. So I'm usually dropping down to if this is a 60 minute, I could even be down on a one minute time frame as it's coming into that to look for smaller time frame setups that are happening in there. So here you can see that time development. And then we have our last one. Now this one has the lowest probability because it already has two corrections that they're the exact same amount of time. Now this one does have Oops, the um, exact same amount of time here. So that is good. We want to again go from that first high, or if there's three highs, use the middle high to anchor our fib fan and then go to that low. Again, there's a lot of overlap in here, but this zone is shorter. It's like the one in here. So that still has a bit of extra risk involved in it. Uh, you can see here that didn't matter, but you need to be aware that that can make a difference, that can matter. This one, if you went from here to here and up, and we were looking for continuation patterns on the upside, you can see that there's a bigger zone of congestion in here compared to the upside move. So that zone of congestion is doubling, or it can even go further than doubling before you get that two-wave move in there. So that's a little bit of a better trend move um, when that happens. It doesn't always happen. When it doesn't, what we don't want to see is just a really rapid move down with no overlap in that move, because that is going to have um, a harder time for those fit bands to work for us. All right, so here's another example. This is um, based upon a trade, um, one of the previous classes that I did uh, a session on. And uh, this was a trade that I initially took based upon the inverse head and shoulders. So look at that volume decline in there. Here's our neckline. Now, the one thing that was not great with this inverse head and shoulders at this point is that I prefer that if you look at this pullback here, that as this is pulling up, I would like that shoulder to be up here. So I want it to be about where this channel breaks down right there. And I don't want it hugging the midway zone of this pullback. When it does that, it means I've got higher risk involved that it's not going to be as high probability for a larger full trend reversal. It can still give me a second wave up that can measure that first wave up where I can get the one-to-one -one return um, compared to that initial move off of the head, but it makes it harder for that trend to just take off and give me um, a really strong impulse move. So if this had formed up here, I would have liked that as a higher probability setup for giving me more than just the one-to-one. -one. That can often go into one, two, three like this. It could go in, do a second correction, not touch the fib fan again, and then 
surge like that, but it needs to be up here to do that. So understanding the trend placement of a setup is also really important in determining our success on that setup. So remember when I talked about the five building blocks, trends was trends development was the very first one that I mentioned. This is why. This is an example of why that trends development and trends placement is so important. So our base at this zone of the trend when it breaks down is going to have a higher probability of giving us an incredibly strong trend reversal as compared to just a secondary pop here. So in this case, I was also looking at the smaller three lows here. And we could have added the fans from there and up as well to watch that if this was, you know, like a, let's say this was like a daily time frame. You could use um, this smaller little two wave trend move in here um, to help time it better on uh, an intraday chart. So the breakout here, here we've got our one to one. I often look at fan levels on the upside as resistance levels as well. So they can be used to help time targets in addition to timing your entry points. Now this pulled back again with another two wave correction. Look at that time development again. So in order for this to have a really strong impulse move off of here, I typically don't want that hitting the fib fan a second time perfectly. When it doesn't touch it, we call it a no touchy. And what that does is it has a better chance of giving a really strong impulse move. Since it did tap it here, I went ahead and took a another position on here. I was just, this is a small time frame, So I was just demonstrating um, how to use these um, on a time frame that was faster for me to do so. And what we have is a nice two wave move, but it's not as strong as the previous move. If this was a daily chart, it's still a nice setup, but you have to be prepared for the greater risk that it's not going to give as strong of a, a continuation as it does in the previous moves. And it needs to go and very quickly break the upside of that channel before you get any pause happening. So this would need to go straight up basically in order to get a good continuation coming off of that. So if you have something that's coming slower off of your fib van, especially if it's hugging the fib fan, but still making higher highs, that break in the fan can actually trigger a reversal on the trade. So when you get it hugging here, that breakdown triggers a short, as well as you can use it as a trailing stop if you're trying to get a little bit more out of your position. So uh, here's another example of this here we've got our start time and i didn't use the first high here because although we have a double top we have a pretty decent zone of correction in here so the overall trench move ends up being a pretty average to slightly stronger than average momentum move you can see it's not substantially stronger than this uptrend here before the start of that breakdown. So this gives me a good level to place my FIB fan. Again, what I would like to see is some sort of reaction off the 50% or the 61.8%. In a situation like this, where it increases speed into the 76.4, again, I'm generally not using that as a trigger point because of the momentum. Also look at the retracement of this move. Does it retrace 50% or more? So if the momentum's increasing into my FIB van, I'm going to wait and use a doubled tap of that resistance level to go and look for the setup 
instead of just using that initial resistance. My interests tend to be lower, of course, as a result of that, but the probability of success is higher because now we have this additional shift in momentum here to give us a stronger continuation on the breakdown. You'd also wanna watch volume. So if volume's declining in here, that's gonna give you a higher probability as well. So yesterday, things were kind of messy, you know, as we were heading into um, overnight session, overnight trading, um, going into the day. So what you can see here is that we have a really extreme impulse move off of the low, again, really short kind of kneecap type of pause in here. So if I was to use a fib fan just going from this low to this high, it's not going to work as well it's going to have a much harder time coming off of your 76.4% fan is going to be right about here. And it's going to have a much harder time putting in a full 100% extension very easily. So as this continues, you can see it widens up and we start to go into this megaphone. So when we have a slightly higher high and then our pullback starts to come back um, further than our previous lows, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that fib fan from that absolute low and shift it to that absolute high. So I'm not going to be relying upon those previous levels as much. What that does is it gives me again the higher probability level for where this reversal can take place. And we can also add Fibonacci retracement levels to see if that is giving a corresponding level. If there's a shoulder over here, we can look at the time extension to see if that has good timing for a reversal at that point. And Initial reversal can be a little bit more risky, especially if your momentum is stronger as it's coming down into that support level. So I'll drop down to a smaller time frame and look for a smaller time frame setup for that as um, a buy to give me that move on the upside. Now, in this case, um, we've got the market closing. We're in earnings season. So this move here is just a whiplash move because of earnings. Typically when I'm looking at continuation moves, what I'll do is my stop will trail along underneath my fib fans. So in a situation like this, I could have gotten flushed out and needed to re-enter um, uh, in that scenario. So on the rest of the position that is. So you've got to, you know, watch out too for the times of the day. So going into um, overnight trading, some of the times where the flushing will happen is at um, 1550 when we have our market on close action. And then right at or after the close, mostly when we're in earnings season. And the earnings are in a company or companies that are in the major indices here, like the NASDAQ 100 or uh, the S&P 100, um, or and not, not as much, the Dow doesn't, those don't tend to give us much for reaction after um, hours, but they can. So um, we've got to be aware of that and know that, hey, you could get flushed out, but if it immediately starts to rebound quickly, I'll get back into it. Here's the retracement level. So based upon this initial impulse move down, you can see we've got that resistance of the 76.4. And then our support is corresponding with our FIB fan as well as uh, the 23.6%, retesting that 23.6% on our retracement level. Oops, too fast. So here's um, how this has played out as we came into today. 
So you can see that it continues to hold. And what's interesting a lot of times is that you're going to get reactions off of uh, these fifth fan levels. Now, when it starts to hug them, you've got to be um, more aware that that can lead to a breakdown. Neither one of these hugging zones is, you know, perfect as far as creating a reversal setup, but we can see, hey, there's a retest of that 76.4% here serving as a nice bounce zone. Three lows here. This was um, a good buy strategy earlier here this morning. I actually took this one and what we would get for like um, a higher probability for like a breakdown would be if you had two waves that were holding that that support level. And oftentimes this can break at a halfway point. So if this is like A, this zone is B, B can be half or equal to A to get a continuation. If it's half, it might just do a two wave move like that, come back and retest that. So this is now going to be fib fan resistance on any bounce. Here's another chart I wanna show you. This is our um, gold. And uh, I had been trading gold coming off of the low there. And I was looking for opportunities, you know, that we could possibly get a bigger bounce on a daily time frame. I was a little concerned because the overall momentum on the downside was still really strong, but I was kind of eyeballing the timing, looking at where you know momentum was shifting, and the possibility of this going into um, a shoulder for a, an inverse head and shoulders pattern. Now, what you'll notice is that if I go from the low to my high here this pulls back and holds that 76.4%, but look at the time development. So when it hits it, it's only a fraction of the time development compared to that upside move. So sure, there can be a smaller time frame buy setups in there. It's also support from where this broke down. So it's a good support level. It's probably also 61.8% retracement um, coming off of this move, but it's not as high of a probability of a pattern that would lead to a really nice break of the high and a measured move compared to here to here. This previous high zone is going to serve as stronger resistance because it pulled back more than 50% and it did it in a pretty short period of time. So in order to get a more decent chance of doing an upside move, I would want to see a secondary correction come into play. Now, here is where we have that secondary correction. So here's the first one. What you'll notice is when we look at that five minute time frame, that upside move also looks pretty extreme, which again can mean that, hey, this might not be the best chart to put a fib fan on. Even though it's not the best, we're still seeing reactions off of those levels, but they're not giving us that full trend extension or trend reversal on the bigger trend that is more ideal. So we've really got to look at this momentum. On a five minute time frame. it looks a lot steeper than we saw in that previous chart. And I'm going to show you a larger time frame too as we go and look at that. But if we look at our fib fan going from the low here where it tests the fan, tests that larger fan and then our last tie in here we are looking at again a two wave correction here and this is the 76.4 percent for that smaller correction so this becomes another buy zone it has a really good move to start with but for continuation this should put in not only a measured move here and up with similar momentum, but it should also go and manage to break to here with no corrections that last any longer than the corrections that are in that first move. So as soon as this pulls back further than those previous corrections, this being the largest one, 
As soon as that pulls back further, that's saying, uh-oh, we've got some problems confirming in here. Another confirmation is that it shouldn't stall at less than a, the 61.8% of this initial move. So it should go at least this far without getting any sort of a stall. So that's again part of our trends development with regards to this pattern, as well as um, uh, looking at momentum factors. So both of those are telling me, ooh, this pulls back, it does a double tap, tap. That's actually not good because it stalled at that shorter period where it really should have gone further. So hugging here, you might have taken this with an initial stop under there, but that break would be your confirmation to go ahead and get out of the position because that tells you, hey, it's going to need to put in a longer correction before it has another chance of continuing. And this is going to be emphasized even further if you just step back and take a look at that larger time frame. So if we look at this one, what you can see is that on the 30 minute, this is an extreme momentum move. It's not falling into what would be a more average momentum move. It is more extreme, which also means that our FIB fans can have a more difficult time holding those support levels to give us a good continuation. Sometimes what you'll have to do is you'll need to take it from this low and go to that second high there to look for your next uh, FIB fan support. Here's um, taking it even further and looking at the entire move here where now that momentum is closer to average and that would provide that next uh, support level. And we actually fell into that pretty harshly. So it wasn't a move where the pullback has at least that one-to-one -one ratio. This came in too fast into that support level for it to be uh, valid. Again, we've seen examples where it can bounce off of that 76.4 where it's too early, but there's also times it just goes right through it. So we're looking at where's the highest probability and what we need to see is that that time development for the base or the correction lasts out longer. So here's another example. Here's our upside move. We're getting this kind of shifting here, holds the 50%, but we don't have this pulling into the 76.4 to give us that bigger head and shoulders. We also don't have the timing proper for a bigger inverse head and shoulders. So breaking out here, even though you've got a two-wave correction, that has a high probability of being a false breakout. Whereas if this had shifted into that 76.4% fan without trying to break early and had the same time development here to here, that would have been higher probability for success. Also, as it breaks, becomes resistance. Here's the an ex chart showing you that. Here's um, another example of a trade. Again, two corrections, the same amount of time. Better chance that if this is a time correction, it's going to get more of a price correction. So that's what I used to exit um, my position there. And see how it's hugging? This is a 76.4. This is based on my trading computer, so I don't have my numbers on there. Um, but then that goes and gives me a nice continuation for uh, the reversal. Here's another example showing us if we look at our time development, this hits 
that 76.4% zone way too fast and bounces along it. And notice A and B here, that space in here before it breaks down is about half of A. So if it's coming in, this is your fifth fan, bounces again. If this is half, that can be a really strong breakdown zone. It can also double, or sorry, go and do like the one-to-one -one ratio and break down at that point. That's actually a trigger on the short side. It's also a do or die point because if this is gonna hold with the shift of momentum into here and bounce up and then do like a secondary correction for a continuation, it needs to bounce to that 61.8% fan or higher before it pauses. So any pause or base that is halfway or lower, higher risk, it's not gonna make it up there. So if you bought that, knowing that it's early here for the time development, but you bought it anyways, thinking, hey, you know, it could bounce and then do a secondary correction. Be prepared for that secondary correction, but know that that can happen. When it hugs this, that's your exit point. Your exit is not going to be under this low. It's going to be when that channel breaks with that fib support. So that can take you from, you know, losing a lot on your trade where, you know, your stop would have hit about here to having a better chance of it being a scratch trade, especially because if this doesn't get going, I would typically um, exit some of the position already because I would have wanted greater confirmation coming out of that level. So this is another great way that we can use um, those FIB fans. All right, you guys, uh, thank you for joining me here for today's session. I hope you learned a lot. I've mentioned a lot of times about those uh, five building blocks of price development and how they work together. Well, I did a class that was uh, three and a half hours long where I went into every single one of my building blocks and how to use them and how they form. And then I went and shared how they play into one of my favorite strategies and how to trade that strategy using all those building blocks, putting them together. Now, um, usually sessions and classes like this that you guys are going to run into, they run you know, pretty close to $1,000 a lot of times more. Uh, I like to keep my education within the limits for how most traders um, that I work with can afford. and easily afford. So, you know, we're looking at $100, three and a half hours of education going into the details that you heard today, but in even greater detail showing specific trade strategy for uh, using these tools. All right. So, David, I have some time here to answer any questions that everyone might have. So, uh, let me know if there's a uh, a question that you might have that I didn't tackle yet so far. Uh, thank you, Michael. Just scrolling up here. Yeah, as Harvey mentioned, um, I'm not using just one fib tool. I'm using basically a combination of the three, but the FIB fans give me um, a better sense of the time development than the other two do. So when you're putting them all together and working together, they provide these do or die zones where if you get a setup that's happening within that zone, your probability of success is very high. So if it's not within that zone, I know even if I take the trade that there's going to be greater risk involved and I might need to manage it more aggressively. Have I looked at uh, Andrew's pitchfork tool? No, I have not. Um, I really haven't delved into a ton of uh, the different indicators that are out there. There's hundreds and if not more than hundreds of them. Um, some of them are more popular and more well known. I come from a background of where I began by first analyzing pure price action. 
So then when I was looking at, hey, what indicators could I use that would provide um, additional confirmation of what I was seeing and that would help me teach other traders the timing, the Fibonacci tools were the ones that stood out. They were the ones where when I taught them how to use it correctly, there was the least chance of them applying it incorrectly, basically. Absolutely. Can the Fibonacci fans be used on cryptos like the Bitcoin? Yep. And on Fridays, um, most Fridays, uh, I do a session at noon where we look at the current markets and Fib fans are one of the main things that I use as well as when we look at, um, we'll look at everything from currencies to Bitcoin to individual stocks. Uh, that session is called Forward Focus. Uh, you can find information on that on TonyHanson.com. I do have a doctor's appointment tomorrow, so we don't have a session tomorrow, but I'm going to be doing a recorded session instead and sending that out to folks that are registered. But usually we are live. And that class is free, so you can join me every Friday at noon for a free educational hour like today. How long does the special last? David, you want to go get it today? <laughs> if you harass my um, my support team, help at TonyHanson.com, they'll give you uh, that price on it. So just tell them, hey, Tony said. <laughs> Her name is Sarah, S-A-R-A, -A, at help at TonyHanson.com. And she can help hook you up. All right, David, thank you for having me back again.